Lord be with you. Pat, you keep this up. I think you'll make a singer one day. I, I think no. Uh, and now, how how much are the CDs? Yeah, yeah. I'm wanting to know. Uh huh. Like fifteen. So the pastor's price is eighteen, twenty, and the five comes back to me. Okay, no, no. Uh, thank you, Pat. Really, I. As you're turning in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14, I do want to say something. Pat mentioned two of those songs Bill Gaither wrote. Is that right, Pat? Um, uh, this may not come as a total shock to some of you, and having not been raised in the church and being of a younger generation, gospel music is not um, always played in my car. Uh, but when I went to seminary, uh, a friend of mine began to talk about Bill Gaither, and then I'd hear other people and, and they said, it doesn't matter what kind of music you like. Bill Gaither is one of those rare souls in this world who's apparently just a very, you know, people of all theological stripes love Bill Gaither. So uh, I always appreciate the words that he writes, uh, in, even if the, the style of music is one that gets you moving, one that gets you thinking, or whatever. His words are always, I know, come from a very deep place. So thank you for sharing that with us, Pat, this morning. I'm going to try not to break your iPad, too. You're welcome. Uh, Luke chapter 14 is where we are this morning, beginning with verse 25, reading through verse 33. <clears throat> now large crowds were traveling with him, that is Jesus, and he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king Going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. May they be your words that we do hear. While whatever words I tend to strew in the way, Father, we step over and are quickly removed from our memories while your words shape us. May we hear your voice calling us to do what you would have us to do, so, Lord, we may be the people you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> well, when I was growing up, I always spent the weekends, most weekends, at my dad's house. That usually meant Friday when Dad got off of work, or maybe sometimes early Saturday morning, Dad would come by the house, pick me and my sister up, and take us out to his place. But there was a season uh, in my life when at Dad's house, there was my stepsister, my other stepsister, my half-brother, sometimes two other kids I didn't know at the time or something. Uh, and then on the weekends, it would be then, then me and my sister. And what that meant was every room and every bed in the house on the weekends was taken. And so I often slept on the couch in the living room. I'd pack my backpack with, you know, a weekend's worth of clothes, and I'd go, and then as soon as i get there, I'd fling the backpack on the end of the couch. Now, as a kid, I loved that. Because what that meant was, as we went about the day and we did everything we were going to do, after we sat down and watched Cops or whatever it was Dad wanted to watch. Dad's a Cops aficionado, by the way. He loves that show. Everybody would just sort of start to peel off one at a time, going to bed, going to bed, you know. And eventually, Dad would get up, and he'd walk over, and he'd turn off the light, and he'd go, all right, now, son, you don't stay up all night watching TV, which, of course, meant I stayed up all night watching TV. 
I remember one night, I even gotten brave enough to get off the couch and sit in Dad's Lazy Boy. You don't sit in Dad's Lazy Boy. And I sat in the chair, and, and I don't know if maybe I dozed off, if I lost the remote, if the batteries had died, but I remember getting sort of enraptured in this television show. There was a man, he had on a denim-colored shirt, white apron, glasses, and man, he was excited. He was standing in, in this kitchen, right? Just, it was covered with jars. Jars of cereal, jars of marshmallow. That's where you keep stuff, you know, in jars. It was Fruit Loops, Cheerios, rice. He even had bags with steaks and things in them. And he went on to talk about how excited he was. He said, do you want to save hundreds of dollars? I might have been 10 years old. Yeah, I want to save hundreds of dollars. He said, well, if I got the thing for you. And he pulled that look like a bicycle pump. It's called the pump and seal. And it was really cool. He did this demonstration. He put marshmallows in a jar, poked a little hole on top, put that thing on there. Marshmallows swole up. Then he cracked the lid, back down the end. Oh, I was hooked, man. It was amazing. And at the end of that infomercial, I remember it. I remember it. He said, now some of you, he's holding it up, some of you may pay as much as $60 for something like this. But you won't pay $60, he said, oh, no. Some of you might pay $50. Oh, no. He said, what we'll do today for three easy payments. Have you ever wondered what that means, by the way? Mitch Hedberg was a stand-up comedian. He used to say, I want two easy ones and one difficult payment. Three easy payments of $9.95. And uh, if you call right now, we'll throw in a, a year's supply of these little seals. Look like scotch tape, but they were seals. And for the first 100 call, it kept getting better. The first 100 callers, guess what he was going to do? He's going to give me a second one for free. Just pay shipping and handling. But it was free. <laughs> second one. I remember thinking this was amazing. I, I found a piece of paper, wrote down the 800 number, went to sleep that night. It, just, it was on my mind. Dad got up the next day, and I said, Dad, Dad, I, I found the answer to our financial woes, right? This guy on TV said we'd save hundreds of dollars if we bought this thing. And I really admire my dad for not just smacking me. He said, son, that, that, they sell that kind of stuff. He didn't say stuff. They sell that kind of stuff on TV all the time. He said, they do. Nobody wants It's too good to be true or it's too cheap to really work. And you know something? I've heard people say the same thing about faith. They sell that stuff all the time. Oh, it's too good to be true. It's too cheap to work. And I understand where it comes from. I've been in this sanctuary just like you have. Preacher stands up there, hoops and hollers, tears off his jacket, tie comes off, sweat just boiling down his face. Somebody's run up and down the aisle, jumped in the baptistry. They're saying, oh, hallelujah, praise Jesus. It's all a wonder. Then the, then the praise and the musicians appear out of nowhere. And he begins to play, and he says, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you want to get saved, just raise your hand, and I'll pray for you. Have you ever just looked around when he does that? I do. Yeah. So do other people. You'll hear him, I see that hand. I don't see it. I see that hand. I see that hand. Somebody will, will, will do that. They'll raise their hand. They'll come on down. And somebody says, well, let me do. He says, that's all you got to do. Just raise your hand, and you're in. They sell that kind of stuff on TV all the time. It's just cheap. Doesn't really work. I think that's why, I think that's why Jesus, in this passage in Luke, he has to stop for a minute. Because it's not just new, new evangelists in the last hundred years who've come up with this stuff. Jesus has been preaching. He's been going around. He's been doing some great stuff. In chapter 14... He heals a man with dropsy. He sits at the table and tells these wonderful stories about the, the, the inclusion and the grandness of God's kingdom. Take the lower seat. God's going to call you up. Go out in the highways, in the hedges, and bring them in. And I can just imagine Jesus is on the way now. They're walking, and he overhears them. Isn't this great? Jesus said, this is what we do. We get in. This is his faith. We're, this is wonderful. And Jesus stopped. Turns around and says, all right, listen, y'all. If you're serious about this, you're going to have to leave your families. If you're serious about this, you're going to have to die. 
If you're serious about this, you better sit down and think about it a little bit more. Don't just come tagging along thinking it's about mansions and crowns and all this other stuff. You better sit down and calculate the cost, Jesus said. Because it ain't easy. He said it's like one of you wanting to build a fence and you, you, you go out there and you stack the stones and you scrape the ground and then you realize, oh, I can't do it. I can't afford it. Or like a king who goes off to war, he says, thinks he's got it really made, got 10,000 soldiers. This is great. We're going to do it. We're going to be victorious. Then he realizes, oh, they've got 20,000 and tanks and jets. Can't do it. You're going to have to count the cost, Jesus said. Now, sometimes we don't do that. You know what? Sometimes we don't count the cost. We just, we, we have a good idea and we plunge headlong into it, thinking, oh, yeah, it'll, it'll work itself out. I think about that uh, when I think about back home. I forget how old I was. I remember they built a super Walmart. That's when you know you're really a big town, right, is when they build the super Walmart. They had the old Walmart. Now I think it's a big lot. It used to be a place called Bud's. Some of y'all may have heard of a Bud's. But out behind it, on the, you could see this, this big old white screen. And then they had cut a little clay road running down beside, beside the shopping center. And the rumor around Enterprise was, they're building the drive-in back. They're getting the drive-in back. Oh, it's going to be great. They had even trimmed some of the trees. They were gone. You could see the screen. Weeks went by. Leaves were put back on the trees. Couldn't see the screen so much. Milkweed and all that kind of weedy grass started growing up on that clay road. Someone said, well, I think, I think they got back there, started cutting stuff down, realized, oh, we really can't do it. Don't have the money. I think now they're building something else back there. Maybe it's another movie theater or something. But I remember they didn't count it. They didn't think about it before. They just plunged headlong into it. That's what some of us do. Like the girl who sat in the pew and heard the preacher preach, holler, and hoop for an hour. Every head bowed, every eye closed. She looked up. Preacher said, come on down. Service was over. He had showed her out to the congregation. He said, look, everybody, let's praise God. The lost sheep has come home, sat down on the front pew with her after service. Well, now next week we'll have the water in the baptistry. Oh, no, I don't want to be baptized. You said in your sermon, I don't have to be baptized. All you got to do is just raise my hand. Well, that's true. We Baptists, you know, we're kind of funny that way. We're called Baptists, but we don't think you've got to be baptized. But we'll see you next Sunday. I'm not, I'm not coming back next Sunday. You said I didn't have to do that. Sermon said all I had to do was raise my hand and I'm in. I'm not coming back next Sunday. Preacher said, oh, well, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And preacher said, well, you know, Thursday, we're going to be down. We're, we're going to bake biscuits and burn some sausage, give them out to the homeless folks at the shelter. I'm not doing that. You said all I had to do was raise my hand, hand and I'm in. She left, and the preacher was sitting on the front pew and asked himself, what have I done? What have I done? Sometimes we don't count the cost, and we wind up not finishing Sometimes we do, though. Sometimes we do count the cost, and we decide it just, it just isn't worth it. It's not worth it. Think back, even back down to, to Enterprise, again, my hometown there on Main Street was a hardware store. Real popular place. They sold everything, nails, caulk, even lumber. You could, they sold Dutch Boy paint. Anybody, I don't even know if they still make Dutch Boy anymore. It used to creep me out as a kid because there was a big picture, a big, big picture of the Dutch Boy sitting on a can of paint. I just thought it looked weird. But all sold paint and all this other stuff. And then, then out on the circle, they built one of them big blue stores. I forget what it's called, owned by some guy named Lowe, I think. Built it out. You'll catch that in a minute. Built it out on the circle. Raw's dried up. Just a few folks, a few granddads and their kids sitting around the counter drinking bad coffee, buying old hard caulk just to keep the place open. But it closed. And then the rumors really started. I heard George Jones was going to buy the place. Yeah, that George Jones. I heard George Jones was going to buy it and turn it into a country kitchen. Isn't that nice? Well, I heard Lori Morgan and Sammy Kershaw were going to buy it and turn it into a Cajun kitchen. I heard it was going to be a flea market. I wouldn't be surprised if it was a church, really. I mean, your church would pop up anywhere. Last I heard, I don't think it's anything. Bank said it costs too much. Everybody came down there. Oh, it's going to cost too much. 
Sometimes we count the cost and we decide it's too expensive, I'm not going to do it. There was a man, you know, who did that. Came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, obey the commandments. You know what that made me think of? When I was growing up, I don't know about you, uh, when we go to the car dealership or something to buy a car, I never once heard anybody say, excuse me, what's the annual percentage rate on this loan? I never heard my family, I never heard any of them say, well, how, what's the term uh, that I'm going, you know what they always said? You probably said it too. What are the payments? Oh, payments, we can get the payments wherever you want them. You can pay on it for 12 years, you can pay on it until Jesus comes back. We'll get the payments. Well, that's what it made me think of. He comes to Jesus, what are the payments? And Jesus says, oh, just follow the commandments. Oh, I do all that. What else? And Jesus says to that man we call the rich young ruler, sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And does he go, amen, hallelujah, I'll do it, and jump in line? No. The Bible says he counted the cost, and he walked away grieving because he had many possessions. Sometimes we count the cost and decide we don't want to do it. It's not worth it. We can't afford it. So we're not going to do it. And then there are those times when we sit down at the kitchen table with a legal pad, the back of the envelope, the app on our phone, and we tally it all up, and it's too much. We can't afford it. And we do it anyway. Because we believe that God's going to hold us up. Because we believe that when we get through it, that God will make us better for it. Like that time when I got the letter in the mail, return address 800 Lakeshore Drive, Birmingham, Alabama. I opened it up, said, congratulations, you dummy. It didn't say that. You're accepted to Sanford. Oh, boy. Also got all this packages about how much it's going to cost, you know, so I sat down, had an old envelope, probably some, some junk mail came in, flipped it over, started writing down on the back of it, tuition, room and board, meals, fees, just guessed at books, wrote it all down, drew a big line, then under it, tallied it up, near about cried. I can't afford that. That's more than my family makes in a year. I can't afford that. Sometimes you count up the cost and you send the letter in anyway and say, I'm coming. Sometimes you can't afford it and you call them up and say, sign me up, I'm coming. Spring semester, there I was, couldn't afford it, there I was. Junior year, couldn't afford it, there I was. Senior year, couldn't afford it. May 2006 rolls around, couldn't afford it. Shaking the hand of Tom Quartz as he gives me my diploma. Couldn't afford it. Sometimes you count the cost and you do it anyway. Because you know that even though you can't afford it, God is going to hold you up through it. Because when we read these words, I don't know about you, I'm ready to throw in the towel. I'm not real fond of my kinfolk sometimes, but I don't know if I'm ready to hate them. I don't know if I'm ready to die, to take up my cross. And I'm going to be honest with you, as much as I talk about it, I don't know. I just don't know if I'm ready to give up all my possessions. It's funny like that. I'm afraid I've instilled it in coal even a little bit. Every time we pray, we pray for our food, we'll pray for whatever. We always have to pray one more time for Daddy's lawnmower. <laughs> coal loves our lawnmower. And so we have to pray one more time for the lawnmower before we move on. So I count up the cost. And I can't afford it. But I do it anyway. Because God will see us through it. And because I'm convinced, I really am, I'm convinced that the things in this life worth doing, we can't do on our own. The things in this life worth doing, we can't afford to do. I remember four years ago now, seems like a long time, four years ago, sitting in a room, I think it was in a Presbyterian church. Me and Sally were there, a, couple, a few other couples. There was a woman at the front hawking a book, you know, telling us about how you could save money. Oh, yeah, it's easy. you drive a nice car, sell it. Get one with 170,000 miles on it. It'll run. Just about to do that. You got a nice house, get rid of it. 
Move into, move into one a little bit smaller. Doesn't matter if your kids have to share a room. This stuff is important. Then she said, oh, well, what you ought to do is maybe cash your paycheck and put some of the stuff in envelopes and then add another one here and set it aside. Can you glue popsicle sticks together to where people want to buy it? Open an Etsy store. That's what they said. So we did all this kind of stuff. Got in the truck. The truck I sold the next day because of what she said. Should have been a preacher. Drove back to Birmingham and said, Sally, I don't think we can afford adoption. I think it's too much. Sometimes. I made my life crack. Sometimes you count cost, and you do it anyway. You do it anyway. Sometimes the cross is too heavy to bear, and you do it anyway. Sometimes the hill is too tall, and you do it anyway. Because you can convince yourself, I can't do it. We can't do it. And it doesn't matter. You're not supposed to do it by yourself. And shame on you if you think, I'm the one who's going to do it. Shame on you if you think, I can do it on my own and I don't need anybody else's help. Because you're lying to yourself. That's the point of the gospel. If you could do it on your own, who needs Jesus? If you can do it on your own, the cross, the cross is nothing but a sad man who died for nothing. You can't do it on your own. Sometimes you count the cost and you go, it's too high. And you do it anyway. Because Jesus is there to walk you through it. To say, you don't have to pay it. But I'm glad you tried. Sometimes we count the cost. And we realize that we can't do it on our own. And friends, that's the gospel. You can't do it on your own. As the old hymn says, not I paid it all, but Jesus paid it all. Thank God, because I can't even afford the payments. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us, Lord, when we are selfish, when we fail to count the costs and think that this thing called faith, this thing called life, is cheap. Now that all it takes is a hand raised, a prayer said, and we're good. Help us, Lord, to see the cross for what it is, the high price paid for us because we couldn't afford it. Help us, God, to count the cost. And when it seems too high, do it anyway. And trust in you. Be with us now, we pray in Christ's name.